Hello, this is Branko Malic of Kali Tribune. Uh, in this podcast, we'll devote some time to problem of conspiracy theories, theories, excuse me, uh, from a certain definite angle. Namely, uh, we'll talk about uh, some uh, about uh, debunkers, uh, mainstream debunkers of conspiracy theories. And uh, we'll say a few words about anti-Semitic uh, conspiracy theories and the prevalent anti-Semitism uh, that is uh, very observable uh, in what is called, let's say, alternative media, community, conspiracy, community, this community, that community. Anyway, in uh, the broad uh, sphere of internet uh, mediated uh, discussions, knowledge, and so forth, so on and so forth. Uh, I, of course, already said a few things about that, but... Uh, this will this will be a different angle. Also, we'll say a few things about Augustine Barrel again. Uh, nothing so, so substantial as to be a sequel to still unfinished Kali Tribune series about Augustine Barrel, uh, but we'll take uh, him as an example of how mainstream uh, both media and academic researchers. Uh, tend to misinterpret him and uh, thereby give a food for thought to their opponents uh, and their opponents would be what they like to call fascist uh, anti-semites and so on and so forth now uh, Augustine Barwell <coughs> who is in effect, the first proper conspiracy theorist who comes in pair, uh, usually with John Robinson, but John Robinson is, in my opinion, uh, rather less academic in his writing about conspiracies in his book, Proofs of Conspiracy. For nothing else, it is uh, significantly shorter than uh, huge Barwell's work. Uh, and uh, Augustine Baruel, one thing that is very important to uh, point out about him, and something that I already point out, pointed out in my series about him, is that the essence of his uh, interpretation of French Revolution as a certain, let's call it, uh, proto-modern deep state went a coup in effect a coup that was deliberate as he would claim is uh, that uh, the uh, the agents of that coup uh, were not essentially freemasons as is usually thought and by any stretch of imagination they were not of Jewish descent. There is nothing in the memoirs illustrating the history of Jacobinism that would uh, go to suggest that there is uh, any kind of uh, ethnic determination to this diabolical <laughs> group. And this is very important to reiterate because uh, when you browse a bit uh, uh, on internet or even if you have access to academic literature about conspiracy theories uh, when you come to mention of Baruel uh, you usually <coughs> uh, find uh, uh, people throwing slurs at him one of them being uh, this generic anti-semite anti-masonic conspiracy theorist the reason why people do this is because they haven't read his book that's first reason and second <coughs> uh, second uh, because nowadays uh, this uh, the very notion of conspiracy theory is uh, married to the notion of uh, anti-Semitism. And this is not uh, some kind of accidental error 
it is deeply erroneous, I think, but uh, it is not deeply wrong because conspiracy theories were used uh, to uh, bolster up anti-Semitism as a mean, uh, especially in a late, in earlier part of 20th century, as a mean to promote fascism and eventually Nazism. That brought about uh, the historical events uh, Europe still remembers with shame, fear, and a mixture of, uh, uh, I would say, pain and fascination, somewhat sadomasochistically. So it is uh, nothing to be uh, uh, astonished about that that people who are in the mainstream of academia or um, publicistics or uh, media uh, automatically reacts to the term of uh, conspiracy theory as something that comes from this netherworld of uh, anti-Semitism and uh, fascism in a broadest sense of the term. In the sense, uh, the fascism is the slur that uh, progressive-minded, progressive so-called minded people throw on their opponents. There are good reasons for this, but uh, no matter how good they are, how justified they may be, they are erroneous. They are erroneous because uh, the inception of conspiracy theory has a history and it is, consp uh, it is not true that there always were conspiracy theory. No, they weren't. Uh, before 18th century, there weren't conspiracy theories proper, not that I know of, uh, at least. Because conspiracy theory presupposes a global conspiracy. It presupposes uh, an idea of global governance, global governance by evil. Therefore, conspiracy theory is uh, can be defined as uh, science or the discipline investigating the acts, uh, the the activity of evil in the world and in history. And this evil is in its essence, when stripped of its attributes and manifestation and uh, temporal manifestations, is absolute evil. It is anti-human, it is uh, anti-moral, it is anti... Let's say these are two antis that I used to uh, use today. Now, <clears throat> in Baruel's view, uh, this evil was the notion that only sense experience is given to man. That uh, human reason can only learn from sen sense experience and cannot move from it. This does not mean that, uh, uh, like in some... Uh, let's say, some philosophies or metaphysics, sense experience is where we start. No, no, no. This is the idea that sense that mind itself is a reflection of sex, sense experience, that it is a product of sense experience and that it is, has got no essence in itself, that it is not subsistent, and that there are no higher principles than sense experience, because this is the idea of French and partially English-British Enlightenment, and to a much lesser, much, much lesser extent, the German. German Enlightenment is something different. It, in my opinion, can't really be extricated from Romanticism and so forth, but we won't go into that. This is very complex uh, cultural historical theme. This is where Baruel originally sees the roots of conspiracy and that conspiracy was a conspiracy of enlightenment not conspiracy of uh, uh, satanists or i don't know some 
occult uh, sect in the sense that by occult we think some kind of special uh, super, supernatural knowledge. Anything but. It is completely opposite. It is the conspiracy of those who want to restrict knowledge. And this is, this is the essence. This is where he starts from. And then he comes, only later comes to Freemasonry. And his idea is that Freemasonry was infiltrated and used by this group of uh, intellectuals and the crowned heads of the 18th century to bring about a coup in France, to bring down or crown and altar, but altar is primer, primer, uh, primary goal, and to transform the way the people think, the way the people are ruled, and in essence to uh, extricate human race from its metaphysical tradition, in the sense that there do exist those transcendent principles and that those transcendent principles can be enshrined as a doctrine in a certain institutions. And that institution in the West is bar non Catholic Church, a Roman Catholic Church. So uh, this is the gist of the memoirs illustrating the history of Jacobinism. Now as for Freemasons, uh, Barwell was of two minds, uh, partly because he was uh, an exile in Britain and was probably uh, dependent on people who were themselves Freemasons, so he had to tread lightly, but he is very scatting about them. I mean, Freemasons in general, not his patrons in Britain. <coughs> and... Uh, uh, he, uh, you really have grounds to think that this is uh, this is on on par with this idea of enlightenment in his eyes that Freemasonry itself is some kind of proto enlightenment and uh, true enough uh, he held that idea but uh, that idea was to be developed in the book. Uh, that was meant to prove his hypothesis that Freemasonry, in fact, stems in its essential form from Manichaeans, from the sect of Mani, uh, the dualist, uh, Gnostic, uh, non-Christian sect that indeed had uh, some peculiar similarities in organizational sense with Freemasonry. It had this initiation and uh, such things and was essentially a dualist uh, dualist uh, sc school of thought, if that thought can be called, where uh, uh, both good and evil are sub absolutely subsistent and uh, equal principles. And he thought that uh, through Knights Templar, this idea was, uh, and uh, this method of organization was kept from those ancient times. Uh, he burned the manuscript of that book uh, reportedly by his uh, 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 by uh, admission of his associates before that that and his uh, volume on Kant he was writing all his life critique of Kant's uh, philosophy uh, obviously he was not satisfied with that so he, what he really thought, we can infer from existing work, but I don't think we are at liberty to put this in the forefront, because in the forefront is what I said. The conspiracy of enlightenment. The conspiracy of and for idea. And now you can notice that there is nothing Semitic in this conspiracy, and indeed... Uh, Barwell uh, was not an anti-Semite by, an, by any stretch of imagination and there is nothing anti-Semitic in his conspiracy theory yet he is uh, often deemed to be one <coughs> you can all, you can look for instance to Umberto Eco uh, who is who was let's say a pop a typical pop intellectual 
uh, who wrote uh, Foucault's Pendulum, I never read that book, and uh, cemetery, Prague, Prague Cemetery, that is the book, uh, partly about conspiracy theorists uh, that just stated in the 19th century. And I'm happy to say that I discovered that there is a, not a lot, but there is a quality scholarship on these problems. Now, uh, one of the foremost authors that really impressed me is a German professor, Michael Hegmeister of Innsbruck. Uh, and I will link in the show notes to his lecture about protocols of learned elders of Zion. I really, really recommend listening to this lecture. That is the professors like him who are investigating the real matter of facts uh, about these mysterious and uh, sometimes uh, ominous uh, books and ideas. Uh, what Hegmeister, now I'm of course making a bit of a leap forward, but bear with me, please. What Hegmeister discovered was uh, that, uh, first of all, uh, Protocols of Sion was not a forgery, stricto sensu. That means that it was not written or composed and written uh, in, in uh, France by agents of Ochrana and that Sergei Nilus, who published it, was an agent of Ochrana. This is a lie. And this, is, this was a conscious lie with a noble cause uh, to uh, denounce the book that was denouncing Jews in such a manner that it significantly uh, uh, contributed uh, to this frenzy that gave birth to Nazism. I will not go deeper into that. He argue, argues uh, for this, I think, conclusively as a historian. And I really, uh, really implore you to uh, watch his lecture. Uh, strict academic lecture. He is, he is no alternative researcher. He is, by the way, expert for Rus Russian loony beans, <laughs> Russian conspiracy theories and so forth. And, uh, Really, really worth if you're interested in 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 the Dugin's background, for instance. Uh, Hegmeister is an author to go to go to, and he has inter very interesting. He seems very open-minded. He is uh, uh, following this internet uh, galimatias uh, of conspiracy theories because he is interested what motivates people there, and he's willing even to give them a benefit of a doubt, which is rather rare in academia. And the reason is probably because he is uh, uh, true to his historian method. Uh, and uh, uh, when he says that uh, protocols are not forgery, he didn't say that they are telling the truth. They are plagiarized from the passages of Maurice Jolie's uh, book. And even René Guénon wrote about protocols when he said that passages from the book were uh, lifted from Arthur Gobineau, the, that famous racist author, although Genon, which is kind of customary in him, doesn't give you a really pe uh, a quote of, on passages uh, that were lifted, so I can't verify this. I don't feel inclined to search Gobineau's books uh, for passages that are lifted. <clears throat> so anyway, it is, uh, but it is not what people are trying to. Uh, they are not. Uh, protocols are not uh, part of that n historical narrative built by likes of Umberto Eco and uh, more or less the whole uh, mainstream academia who is n uh, not researching into these things. And this is very dangerous. So now we'll come back to Barwell. So they can, uh, the reason why they do this, I would say, is because they want to show the lineage of the, what they call reactionary thought. From the earliest days to uh, Second World War to prove that people like Baruel and others were all of the same mindset. That they were dark, mm, uh, dark evil reactionaries uh, that were hell-bent on looking for a scapegoat 
and that this in effect brought about uh, Holocaust and so on and so forth. The real reason is that all those intellectuals have a religion and this religion is called French Enlightenment. And this religion, I think, is very ill-advised. It is wrong. It is not based upon truth. And somebody like Baruel attacks the principle of enlightenment, but what he does not attack is reason. Because the reason is not identical or convertible with enlightenment. Now, I am putting things as simply as is possible here and excluding or bracketing off many problems you might have with somebody like Barwell and which I have and which every modern man by his nature and he, his, his historical mold has to have towards this because uh, Barwell, let us be crystal clear about this, is a monar French monarchist. He had no use for republi republics, for democracy, and so on and so forth. But he is not... <sighs> he is not what they call evil reactionary. He is not some morally uh, deficient uh, dwarf <laughs> that hates human reason, uh, hates human virtues, and so on and so forth. The only thing is that he considered uh, the ancien regime to be capable of cultivating those. And that transition was not needed, that transition, in that way at least, a revolutionary way, the transition was there to bring about a counterfeit of what it uh, promised to give. This is, this is Barrel's stance. <coughs> And anyone uh, trying to rescue the idea that uh, the truth, not an idea, the truth, uh, let me put myself on my standpoint so nobody will be confused about where I stand. The idea uh, that there are eternal principles of the world of the mind and of the morality, aesthetics, and so on. This is the idea uh, that was defended by the first conspiracy theories, essentially, in my opinion. And this is the idea that academics, both mainstream academics and writers like Umberto Eco and others, and anti-Semites, hate. <laughs> <laughs> this is what they both uh, want. They don't want actively to destroy it, uh, but they want to keep uh, the illusion living, namely the illusion that enlightenment is the final, first and final word on uh, faculty of human intellect, whereas it is most certainly not. And this is why there is very little real research around uh, Baruel and such uh, writers on behalf of these uh, pop intellectuals. Of course, you have specialists, and I'm happy to say there are specialists uh, on this subject, as Hegmeister, that are the real good authors. You have, for instance, uh, Klaus Obenhauser, a German uh, a very young German academic. I will link one of his articles in the show notes, but unfortunately it's only in German. Uh, article on the hypothesis, laying down hypothesis of the uh, origins of this idea of Jewish, anti-Semitic uh, idea of Jewish conspiracy that is extremely interesting. I will say a few words, only a few words about it. Namely, it stems from a letter. This is so-called Simonini letter because it was uh, allegedly written by Gian Battista Simonini, Italian officer, who wrote it to none other to, but then to Augustine Baruel. I think 1807. 
And in this letter, this Simonini claimed, or who was posing as Simonini, claimed that, uh, or was it 1817? I'm sorry, I, I don't have I don't have notes on me right now. Ugh, I'm inexcusable, but I'll put this in the show notes and I'll I'll put a foot, few footnote clarifying the matter. Don't worry. Uh, Simonini claimed, uh, to cut the long story short, that uh, Baruel was right about everything, but he didn't know that these Freemasons, Ill Illuminati, which were, the, uh, in, in Baruel's view, uh, the spearhead of Freemasonry, the, 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 the real, the real uh, occult lodge that was manipulating things, uh, not because it was occult in the sense that it had special powers, but that it was uh, most radical, Rousseauist, as in Jacques Rousseau, uh, sect, and it was best organized. Uh, that they were in fact Jews, that the Jews were, uh, ethnic Jews were behind this all, and that Jewish ethnicity, implication is that Jewish ethnicity is by its very nature, against Christianity, against throne and altar, against civil society, and so on and so forth. And what Baruel did? Baruel first uh, didn't uh, take this seriously, and he doubted uh, the authenticity of the letter, and to this day this authenticity was contested. Yet it, it, it came to pass now, as Obenhauser informs us, that letter indeed is authentic. Although we don't know who Simonini is, but he, uh, there are other researchers who claimed, I haven't had time to verify, uh, that he indeed did exist. And he did write this letter. As is usually the case with these historical, uh, contested <laughs> historical documents, everybody contesting them for hundreds of years, and then somebody just finds something of that in archive, archive and proves that it really is existent. Uh, Baruel uh, didn't accept this uh, lightly. He was later when he, uh, he went even so far to consult the Pope on the matter, uh, the French minister of police, he was uh, very because at that time a secret police used forgeries to manipulate people, uh, intellectuals and so forth, as they do now. Uh, and uh, at the time when Napoleon uh, called the Great Sanhedrin, that is the event where he uh, made a in effect, uh, a deal with the Jewish community in France and in, uh, in his in the regions of Europe, he conquered of uh, new tolerance towards Jews. Uh, d somebody implored Barrel to publish that letter, and he declined for the reasons explicitly for the reasons of uh, fear that it could uh, it could. Uh, affect uh, a violence towards Jews. So this tells us something about Baruel's character and it tells us that he was of two minds about this letter. He did, uh, it did incite him to note only that uh, uh, Grand Orient de France uh, had a few Jews in its me as, as, the, as, as members and Grand Orient de France in Baruel's uh, view was the a main uh, focal point of revolution as uh, for organi organizing uh, the revolutionary cells throughout France, in the whole of France, in, in the last village of France. So that gave him, they gave him a pause to, uh, to thought. But you can see that he was not, uh, not only he was not anti-Semite, uh, he was <laughs> maybe anti-anti-Semite, he was very wary about this thing. Although uh, what he learned was that letter indeed was uh, authentic, it was not, it was not a forgery. So it probably made him think, but he made nothing of it. There are comments of his on this letter. I'm afraid that I cannot put my hands on them because they are not online. I cannot travel to probably some French archive and uh, read them, but uh, and I have to leave it at this, at that. Now, what happened later is when this letter was widely promulgated, 
in the later 19th century and probably in the various iterations that made it look more spicy. Uh, some authors uh, spliced this anti-Semitic uh, conspiracy theory from the letter onto, uh, onto Baruel's uh, narrative of French Revolution. And you can guess uh, for yourself from there what happened. And uh, Oberhausen's thesis is that uh, the, the inception of this uh, anti-Jewish conspiracy theory is, can really be uh, traced to this letter. And using this letter to infuse uh, other views that are maybe even con in contradiction to this with this racialist conspiracy theory that eventually gave birth to uh, systematic form of uh, protocols of the learned elders of Zion, and it is uh, known that Rosenberg, Alfred Rosenberg, uh, a Nazi ideologue, uh, made very good, big use of this letter, and he was the publisher and uh, promulgator of protocols and protocols were widely promulgated in Germany and they played, not only in Germany, throughout Europe and uh, they made a great impact on, uh, <coughs> on the rise of uh, Nazism but it is very interesting to note and I implore you really uh, listen to what Hegmeister says about it they, uh, uh, Nazis stopped promulgating uh, protocols at one point because they realized that their state, their German Third Reich is ominously resemblant to the system of Antichrist quote-unquote that is uh, described in protocols. So go figure. Well, protocols are a story in themselves, I won't go deeper into that. They seem to be kind of archetypal, uh, archetype of all modern fears of totalitarian state and for some reason they are attached to one distinct ethnic uh, group uh, which made them a weapon uh, to beat uh, European Jews with it and it was very effective and uh, now I'll turn to, to, to uh, conspiracy theories of today and consumers of conspiracy theories which for some reason or the other uh, in I'd say 90% cases end up anti-Semites. <laughs> and this is because they don't know their own history and because they have this uh, need for the scapegoat and to make absolute evil tangible. The reason why, there are many reasons why anti-Semitism is looked as practically a devil worship today. And some of those reasons are, in my opinion, very good. <laughs> not surprising if you know the history, especially in Europe. This does not mean that you cannot discuss the questions of whether liquid party of Israel should exist in this world because it is such an abomination to some, uh, in opinion of some very intelligent people I read. And uh, if you say this, uh, chances are you'll be called anti-Semite. I have no problem saying things like this. I am not saying them because I'm not investigating those problems. I don't have no time, resources, no knowledge. I'm investigating different things. Yet, for some reasons, uh, we on Kali Tribune get this uh, anti-Semitic comments where I'm called names, which is not a problem. You call me name, I'll call you two names. Uh, by those people who want to see this. They, they think that everybody who is not uh, anti-Semitic is in fact a coward. And I think the reasons of, of why uh, people shun anti-Semitism is uh, that anti-Semitism brought about this great war in Europe uh, to a large extent was caused by anti-Semitism. There are other causes, but this was a very... Uh, con uh, protocols, <laughs> this book was very important in the build-up of Nazism because those were times where people were still carried by ideas in their actions.
Those were less cynical times. Maybe more brutal, but less cynical. People believed in things. <laughs> Usually wrong. But they believe now. They don't believe in anything, so they can't understand how this can happen, that one book causes such upheavals. Why it was possible uh, in the first part of 20th century? It is probably not possible now, because there is this underlying trauma of it being possible before, as is always in history. Going a pendulum swings from plus, absolute plus to absolute minus, uh, destroying everything in between. So this is it. Uh, there is uh, the the idea. I will conclude by uh, going to the beginning. My idea, if I can be personal for a moment, is that the main problem uh, that uh, conspiracy thinking should address, the only problem that is legitimate, in my opinion, in fact, is this problem of the bringing down of tradition with a big T. I'm not really Gennonian, but I like this word because this is the word uh, that is uh, uh, convertible with the term scientia sacra, the sacred doctrine. And this sacred doctrine is a Christian teaching, a Christian theology, Christian metaphysics, Christian poetry, everything that makes you a uh, part of the, the tra tradition that was implanted in history uh, by the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, so that we can be, uh, that we can, uh, no, uh, we can uh, have my position as completely clear. There are other positions that are very similar. For instance, this Genonian traditionalism that uh, considers. Uh, other traditions uh, equally not all no, not all not equally but but uh, substantially valid and i think i'm very fond of it because i know by my experience that there is truth in it but i can't explain how this truth uh, fits in some kind of bigger picture i'm not capable of this and i don't think anyone is so i see uh, conspiracy as the a bringing down of the world when this tradition was valid. And this bringing down is something that actually happened. And how it happened? Was there a, co a conscious will behind it? This is an interesting question. And this is a very dangerous question because as everything going, uh, every inquiry going into uh, non-human evil, evil that is greater than human intelligence is very dangerous and very misleading. Uh, but I think that uh, uh, the idea that this absolute evil can be tied to a certain ethnic group is counter-propositional. And it is very evil in itself because it is the sign of the weakness of the mind that seeks the scapegoat. And this kind of thinking <clears throat> had a significant impact on the ills of modern world, of this great war and the aftermath. Because uh, those people who comment, who, who attack people like me uh, with questions, why don't you bring forward the Jews and so forth, and something of that sort. They should reflect on what they want. If they are really convinced uh, that uh, this special ethnic group is a kind of tribe of demons, then they should uh, try to imagine uh, the solution of problem posed by this tribe of demons. And the solution, a solution will inevitably point out to in the, in the direction of Hitler and Nazis. Therefore, this means that this conspiracy theory they are advocating was already abroad. It was mainstream, not only in Germany. And it brought about a mass murder. And this is the rational reason why it is shunned for Christ's sakes. This is completely obvious to anybody balanced. Uh, the thing of uh, preventing free speech about, for instance, policies of Israel is completely other thing. It is inflation of the, it is misuse of this fact.
and by doing but making a casual comments advocating this you uh, under false uh, names uh, on internet and uh, in the internet anonymity uh, people people are keeping themselves safe from scorn of their fellow men more intelligent and more morally aware fellow men but they are not keeping themselves safe from evil that is in them because without scorn and ridicule that evil will not be easily purged it will just state and in the internet age with all those reality tunnels it is very easy to find uh, collaborative evidence to everything you say so this is the reason why on Kali Tribune uh, there is a policy of uh, rather harsh treatment of uh, anti-Semitic uh, slurs and conspiracy theories. The other reason is even, even stronger, it is because they are stupid. And I really can't stand stupidity. <laughs> and because, among other things, it bears, <coughs> it has... Uh, terrible effect on a sense of humor it makes people humorless and believe me humorless when you meet somebody that is totally humorless that cannot laugh at anything <coughs> except in scorn that cannot find anything genuinely funny and heartening in the world that is that he cannot see anything good in the world rest assured that uh, this man or woman has a great problem with evil and it is very probably on the verge of being consumed by it and this is something I want I don't want to see if I may be personal again around me even in the virtual space so thank you for your attention this was Branko Malic of Kali Tribune signing out